Does that look correct? Can people see? Yes. Fantastic. Um, first off, I want to thank you, Jason, for organizing this. It's, it's just a really wonderful way to spend a Thursday afternoon. And, I, and though I regret not having the deep dish pizza around to accompany the, the panel, I do appreciate the opportunity to see what other people are working on. Um, as well, uh, my name's Mark, um, co-authoring this with Zenobia, and I'm an assistant professor at Princeton in the politics department, uh, focusing on quantitative methods in political science. My research has touched on a few different subfields substantively, but my applied work tends to focus on um, some combination of machine learning and causal inference in that Venn diagram somewhere. And before we continue, okay. I had my music playing in my background. So anyways, <laughs> I didn't realize until I started talking. Okay, um, situating this particular talk that's coming up now, you'll, it is very, very, there we go. Okay, it's very new. Let's do this so I can see the time. Excuse me while I just get situated here. Okay, this way I can see the clock. Wait a second. Did you lose the... You stopped for something, but yeah, you're back. Is that better? Okay, sorry. I just wanted to be able to see the clock too. Okay. So the title of this um, has changed a few times. We reserved the right to change it a few times. Oh, uh, to introduce Zenobia. Zenobia, is a, you're a third year student, right? Zenobia or fourth? She's a, she's a fantastic grad student here who focuses in, on IR and through arm twisting um, more and more methods work. And the, this, the topic of this uh, paper has stayed the same while the title has changed around quite a bit. And for today, we're calling it Improving Variable Importance Measures. And I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to present this work and, and following along because this is really, really new. We don't have a manuscript yet. Um, our, our, we're hoping to air this more fully at Palmeth, and, and we appreciate the opportunity to like share ideas. The point being, if you have questions or feedback, please hop in and let me know. Just start talking. This is all brand new. The unifying idea of this, though, is improving variable importance measures, and that's stayed the same throughout. We'll talk about where the project is at and how we anticipate extending it in the future. <laughs> so as a, as a motivation, um, random forests and boosting are two now very, very well established 20, 25 year old uh, machine learning methods that consistently give um, excellent predictions. So off, they're, they're probably the best, and I'll defer to Jason, but I, I just think of them as the best off the shelf conditional mean models that exist. Um, they offer cutting edge performance in terms of prediction, there's easy to implement software, just a couple of lines in R, a couple of lines in Python, and the methods are intuitive and easy to explain. We'll talk about some of them in just a moment. So one of the shortcomings is that these methods are still black box, right? You get these excellent predictions, but it's a challenge to explain what variables are driving the predicted values or driving the model or not. Um, we'll talk about the existing variable importance measures, but as we show below in a couple, um, in the most prominent cases, the existing variable importance measures either have the wrong null distribution or don't have any clear null distribution at all. At best, the existing variable importance measures in the literature are um, descriptive and aren't meant for it or and aren't suited to inference. Even though people are increasingly using random forests they, and boosting, they want them to be useful for um, identifying explanators or connecting explanatory power with predictors, and that just doesn't seem to be the case. And we're gonna talk about why, and then take a stab at, at fixing it. So beginning, we should, in the beginning, um, we should talk about some of the existing methods for measuring how important a variable is <coughs> in these machine learning methods. The, uh, the methods that are most commonly used split into one of two different types. The first are permutation methods. And these are, it, this is already implemented in the random forest implementation and you'll find it in boosting methods. 
<clears throat> and this is a per, and this is a permutation method. So what you do is you say, here's one of my variables, say x3. I fit the model to all the data and I capture the mean squared error. Then what I'm going to do is permute the variable x3 and see what that does to the predictive accuracy of my model. And to the extent that manipulating m3, just x3, just permuting it up and down, to the extent that doing so um, makes my model perform worse, I think x3 is a useful explanatory variable. So we attribute the change to x3 for the change. Um, we attribute to x3 the change in predictive accuracy or the change in fit attributable to a model with that variable permuted or not. All right. The second method kind of seems to work, but we're not sure what it is or why um, it works. But this is implemented. GRF, um, the uh, Wagner and Athey's um, random forest package in R, have a, a variable importance measure that they characterize as a simple weighted sum of how many times feature I was split on at each depth of the forest. And as near as we can tell, and we reserve the right to like spend more time looking into this over the next few months, that seems to be how they characterize it. Short of actually going into the code, this is all we know that it is. So as a simple weighted sum, um, it's never zero, right? Or unless the variable is never selected. But we're not sure what the null distribution is, right? What would a noise variable look like under this measure? So those are, those are sort of, that's this, as our reading the lay of the land for- Can I ask you a quick question regarding that? Please, please, please. My, my intuition would be that a noise variable wouldn't be systematically selected at different depths of these forests because it wouldn't, it wouldn't improve the model fit at all. Oh, absolutely. Except the way the, random, the generalized random forest works is they select five variables at random and then pick the best one. Yeah, again, so if it was a noise variable, it wouldn't be the best one. Um, it could be if but, yeah. five of them are all noise variables. Sure, so if all of your model is noise, then the most important variable in that noise model will also be noise. That doesn't seem like a problem to me. Oh no, but say for example, if you have like a giant data set with like say 60 features and maybe 30 of them are noise. And it happens that when you run a GRF, like five of the chosen one uh, among the 30 noise variables, then that could happen. I mean, it could, but the, the idea would be like, it shouldn't in, if, if the random draws are, you're sampling from your 30 variables often mm -hmm. enough, and you're going back to the pool and you're killing off the trees that aren't working very well. I'm not sure, I'm not but clear why a zero wouldn't be the right. I, I'm not sure what we're trying to, yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is with this technique other than maybe it's a little bit difficult to interpret. I have a question. May I ask you a question? Please. please. Uh, let's, um, oh, okay. I, you know, I think, I think it'll be more productive to, uh, unless it's a clarifying question, to just uh, let the presenters continue and uh, yes. hold the questions for later. So, it, it, Arthur, is it a clarifying question? Uh, no, it's not a clarification question. Okay. So, uh, let's, just, let's just continue and, and just hold, we'll hold the questions till uh, after the presentation. Thanks. So, so, to come back to the first question, and please come back to that in questions and answers. Um, the GRF has a habit of, in, in the data sets that we use, it tends to select all of the variables at least some point, and we don't get any zero variables um, in when we run it on UCI net data down the line. As to what should happen theoretically, that's still something we're trying to understand. But I'd be glad to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, the, the motivation for this particular project was a set of data that um, Noah Foster here in Zenobia gathered a survey experiment in um, Estonia. And Zenobia just wanted to know which variables were most important in predicting the outcome. So this was Zenobia, this was, a, um, this was an MTurk experiment, right? And then you're spiraling it into other ones? Uh, no, it's recruited through Facebook, constructed to match oh. the national census adult population in Estonia. So thank you. So, so the, the, the outcome here is whether or not the very, whether or not the, the respondent is voting for a particular party. So um, 
in this case, if you look at GRF and random forest, this is just a figure of using 12 different, of, of the variable importance measure in 12 different seeds across the same data. So this is, it's given the exact same data each and every time. And we just want to know how, what's the variance or the fluctuation in the rankings of the variable importance measure. And looking across these, GRF actually seems to do reasonably well in terms of coherency. But coming back to the earlier question, um, all of the 54 variables, I believe, show up, um, or 50 some variables show up at least one time out of the 12. The other issue, it's actually reasonably coherent up towards the top, but over here, the inference on it starts to fan out. And your inference can actually depend on um, which seed you want. Again, this is all on the same data. You see a similar pattern with random forests, although the variance in the rankings are higher under the permutation test. So it's relatively uh, straightforward in the first four, five, six variables. And then it just sort of fans out into something that doesn't necessarily lead to proper, that doesn't lead to convincing inference much beyond that. This is our motivation. We're going to talk about some of the methods we have to try and um, help out in these scenarios. <coughs> the overarching goal of our method is to develop a method that is comparable in performance and mean squared error relative to GRF and random forests, while still returning a theoretically valid variable importance measure, by which we mean that it has a null distribution centered on zero, or at least we can characterize the null distribution. Um, the setup of this. So we're going to assume observations run from one to n, index from one to n. Yi is going to be the target or dependent variable that we want to predict. And for this talk, we're just going to focus on mean squared error <coughs> um, and the regression problem. Then the covariates xi are going to be a vector of p covariates or features that we're using to predict y. And then xi j perm is going to be the ith vector with the j variable permuted across observations. Okay, So this is going to denote just this xi variable, except the j variable has been permuted. We're going to use um, a few different functions in this analysis to characterize what we're doing. The first thing we'll need is a loss function indexed by parameters theta, which just gives us a sense of how close xi is to yi parameterized by theta. Um, there's the empirical loss function, which is just the average of the loss function over observations. Then there's the risk function, which is the expected value of the loss function. We're going to use two more elements. Um, the first, the estimate theta hat, is going to be the minimizer of the empirical loss, how, however we characterize that. And the population minimizer um, is going to be the true value that minimizes the risk. All right, hopefully this is reasonably standard type material. So beginning with the variable importance measures, we're going to talk for a moment about the variable importance, the permutation based variable importance measures. <coughs> the way these work is we're going to estimate theta hat on the sample, where theta hat are the parameters of the tree or the forest or the regression or the SVM or the what have you. And we're going to compare the empirical loss under Xi and the empirical loss under the permuted Xij. So the estimated variable importance measure for variable J is going to be the average increase in loss attributable to permuting the Jth observation over the observed sample where the variable importance measure for j is the population analog, based around the true value with n goes to infinity. All right. The larger this variable importance hat measure is, the more important we estimate the variable to be. So the, question, the first question we're asking is, do we want to use um, a permutation-based approach to measure variable importance? And the answer we assert is no, and we're going to provide a simple example, hopefully with a reasonable intuition as to why. <clears throat> Assume um, we're going to run a standard linear model with interest in beta 1. And let's assume we just have an outcome variable, two covariates, and we just want to run a simple linear regression. So in this case, we get estimates, y hat i, beta hat 0, beta hat 1, and beta hat 2. No interactions, nothing. Just a very, very simple model. 
And the question we're asking is, do we want to compare this model to this model? So the residual sum of squares under this model to the residual squares, sum of squares under this model to figure out how important Xi1 is. And that's the question we're asking. Um, and the answer is not quite. We had to think about this for a while. So let me show you how this works again in the simple regression setting. What we're going to do is we're going to define the, the uh, predicted value of x, xij, as the expected, the predicted value of xij given all the other x's. And then we're going to define the partialed out version of xij as xij minus its predicted value, again, giving all the other x's. This, this concept, and um, we didn't have time to go into it too much, but this concept is kind of floating around in the literature and in some interesting places. But the idea here is that for the j variable, we're going to partition it into two parts, a part that's explained by the other x's and a part that isn't. Those two are obviously mutually exclusive, at least in population. And what our argument boils down to is that if we want to figure out how important variable j is, we only want to manipulate the part of j that's not explained by the other covariates. In one sentence, that's our basic insight. Um, to figure out how important j is, we want to see the effect of permuting it, but we only want to permute the part that's not affected by the other x's. Why is that? Because, and, and this gets more um, pronounced in machine learning or high, high dimensional models, but basically, this x hat ij, if you permute all of xj, you're also permuting some other part of xij that's explained by the other x's. And that's going to mess up other parts of the model, what trees are selected, um, what splits are selected, that sort of thing. And it's going to lead to a misleading sense of how important the variable is. Mechanically, it's the difference between um, running a bivariate regression, a bunch of bivariate regressions, and a multivariate regression. We want to partial all the other x's out of the x we're in, the covariate we're interested in before we see how important it is. Returning to our simple model with uh, two covariates, what our argument is that what we want to compare is y hat i beta hat zero with x tilde i1 and x hat i1 and x tilde i2 and x hat i2. So what we're going to do is we're going to take x i and we're going to split it into x tilde and x hat. And we're going to take xi2 and split it into x tilde and x hat. And then we're only going to permute this part of it. So we want to compare the residual sum of squares under this model to the residual sum of squares under that model. All right? Is, is the point passively clear? Please interrupt if there's a clarifying question. So our process, just in the simple linear regression case, um, we're going to go to the original data and generate partialed out and predicted x's. We can just do that with a regression. Then we're going to cross fit. We're going to estimate the coefficients on half the data and predict on the other half and get the mean squared error. Then we're going to permute the partialed out variable on the other half and gather the mean squared error. So in this sense, we get, here we get the in-sample mean squared error. Here we get in-sample predicted mean squared error. Here we get the in-sample predicted mean squared error under permutation. We're going to switch the roles of these two and then repeat. Then we're going to compare the cross-fitted mean squared error for the perm um, we're going to compare the cross-fitted mean squared error of the perm permuted part compare the cross-fitted mean squared error to the permuted partialed out mean squared error. So to show you what this looks like before we hit the next slide, what we're saying is um, we're going to take the variables and, and partition them into predicted and partialed out variables and only permute the partial out variable to estimate its importance. We're going to compare that to just fitting a linear model on those two variables and permuting one of them. So the simulation that we're going to run, um, we have 50 observations, two variables. Okay, The covariates are multivariate normal. They correlate at 0.8. The, I, the noise is going to be IID standard normal, um, just Gaussian noise. And our outcome, our target variable, is going to be yi is xi2 plus epsilon i. So in this setting, xi1 doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't enter. And we want to know, if I fit a regression with x1 and x2 and permute x1, how does it perform in identifying which variables matter? And if I separate into the partial and predict it out, what happens? 
And you can see the effect here, even in this very, very simple setting. So if I regress the outcome onto x1 and x2 and permute x1, this is the change in mean squared error attributable to x1. So x1 seems to matter across a large number of um, simulations. It has a positive bias to it. If we only permute the partial out version of x1, so if we fit our model using the partial and predicted out values, then only permute the partial out variables, you get something that looks like this, which is actually the median is just slightly below zero. The mean is exactly zero to three decimal places. And you get a null distribution on the variable importance measure that's centered on zero, which is where you'd want it to be. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to repeat that process, except instead of linear models, we're gonna plug in random forests and boosting steps and things like that, okay? So we're gonna take that last algorithm that we used on the linear model and um, complexify the algorithm while preserving the basic point. <clears throat> so in this case, we're gonna generate predicted and partialed out covariates using the random forest. So we're gonna take each of the variables and use a random forest to predict and partial out um, the covariates given all others. So we have two different sets of covariates we're working at. Then um, we just find it easiest to engage in, uh, to code up a boosting algorithm, which is just an upgraded gradient descent. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna initialize the residuals as the outcome minus its mean, a step size of eta is 0.1 times the standard div of y. Then for each iteration, we're gonna follow the, we're gonna go through the following process. First, on the full sample, we're going to find the two covariates that best model epsilon hat i comma t. We can talk about that and um, we can talk about how this works, but for now, um, we're just finding, we're using an f statistic to figure out which two variables work the best. Then um, we're going to split our sample in half into an auxiliary sample and an estimation sample. And then um, in the auxiliary sample, from the two best covariates, we're gonna construct a tree from the predicted values, and then another tree from the partialed out values. And we're gonna regress the current residuals on the tree indicators. In the estimated sample, we're gonna take the um, fitted values of the residual on the, we're gonna take the fitted values, these, we're gonna use this model to predict down here. And we're going to estimate variable importance by, move, by manipulating the partial out variables and estimating the effect of the partial out variables on um, the mean squared error. The next step is we're going to cross fit. So we're going to take these two and, and uh, swap them. So we get an estimated value for each observation. Then we're going to update the residuals and repeat. All right. This was an understandably brief, but um, if there are questions or clarifying questions, please do let us know. Can you uh, say again what 2.2 is? The auxiliary sample? Sure. What we're going to do is we're going to learn the tree model on half of it. We're going we're to generate a prediction off half the data in the auxiliary sample and then predict it on the other half. So we're only, so we're never using the same data to learn the tree structure and predict the residual and predict the fitted values. Does that make sense? So we split our, it's a subsample approach. We take half, we take our data, we take half of it, fit these two different trees to it, take the tree structure and then um, take that tree structure to predict the outcome on the other half. And then we swap halves. Was that more clear or wait till questions or? Uh, my question was uh, about the regressing the current residuals on the tree indicators. I'm just not familiar oh, with, with that. Absolutely. So we have a tree in terms of the X hats and a tree in terms of the X tildes. The trees themselves are just, the, the fitted values, the sample fitted values from a tree come from, you can represent them as just regressing the outcome on the indicator variables for the terminal nodes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the um, indicator variables for the terminal nodes from this tree and the indicator variables from the terminal nodes from this tree, enter them into a regression of the outcome onto those terminal node indicators and fit a model up in this sample then use it to predict down here. Did that address the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
what that does is it gives us one tree in terms of the predicted covariates and another one in terms of the partial length. All right, so how does this perform in, ter perform in terms of mean squared error? Across a, a variety of different UCI net data sets, we're gonna go through two of them now. Um, we do some combination. We generally do better than the random forest algorithm and we're competitive with GRF on depending on how you measure, the, um, depending on the data set, one to the other. So in this particular study, one thought we had is someone may say, instead of doing your algorithm, why not just put in partialed out and predicted X's into GRF and random forest? And we tried that and um, across settings, the mean squared error is actually pretty bad relative to just including the full covariates. So there's not much point we found to doing this, but we tried that first in order to say, try and save ourselves a lot of coding. <clears throat> this is the random forest mean squared error. And the way we did this, is we took the data set, split it in half, fit our algorithm to half, and then at the number of trees or the number of steps, we just recorded the out of sample prediction in the half uh, that was a pure held out set and went with the model that was, had the best held out predictive sample, predictive value. Um, are there ways to improve this? Yes, we're gonna talk about those towards the end. As I mentioned, we're still ongoing with this, but very open to ideas. But what you'll notice is that our boosting goes down pretty low. It starts to come back up on this data set, but we find the best value here, which in this example does beat ran generalized random forests. In the next one, generalized random forests does a little bit better than us. So this is the airfoil self noise data. We're gonna run through, systematically run through UCI net regression problems. Um, here's the GRF and random forest with the partial and predicted out values. Um, here's the random forest. Here's us and here's GRF. Across the different data sets we see, we see we beat random forest just as implemented in R. And um, depending from data set to data set, do better or worse than GRF across in data sets in terms of mean squared error. The um, Estonia data, this is uh, Zenobia's data, we actually do notably better than random forest and boosting. So again, these are the partialed out ones, which we're probably gonna drop at some point or put in an appendix because there's not much point to doing them. And GRF and random forest fluctuate around the same mean squared error, and we come out looking better. Now, I don't want to be in the business of overselling this right now. Um, what we're shooting for, I don't wanna play the, my machine learning method gives a better mean squared error than your machine learning method uniformly type argument. At the very least, we're trying to um, argue that it's comparable in mean squared error across a bunch of different settings. We did it across simulation settings, found the same results, but the problem with simulations is always they can be um, engineered so that you look bad or worse or something, you know, good or bad or something like that. So that's the idea here. Then returning to our variable importance measure, and this is our focus, and as you'll see, this, isn't, this is coming along, and we're still working on cleaning this up. But across the 12 different seeds, we get a slightly different story than the other methods where we only um, choose 20 of the variables, 21 of the variables in total out of the 50. So we're selecting from a smaller set of the variables and a lot of the variables only come in one or two times. As before with the other methods with vote ideology, um, that's the one that seems to matter the most. Next is trust in parliament, which seems to always come in. And we seem to be picking up some of the same features, but to be completely frank, we just put this together this morning um, and it's been honestly a bit fluid over the last few days. So I don't wanna dwell on this particular figure. What I would like to say is our target would be to um, come up with a variable importance measure that can be analyzed and arguably give a better, give a better result in terms of how we interpret these things. Um, so nobody, was there anything you wanted to add on this figure? Uh, no. Okay. So when I say work and project, the reason there's only 12 different seeds instead of 100 is this is like, we're doing this now. So moving forwards, and here's where I'm opening up the door for advice or help with this. Um, one of the things we want to figure out is like, we keep on doing better in mean squared error than random forests, and often better than generalized random forests, and like, you're not supposed to do that. So we're trying to figure out what it is and why. And we have some ideas, analytic and computational, but I could use some help in trying to figure out how to think through the problem, not necessarily answer it, <clears throat> but what dimensions we might want to explore. 
as well, um, we split half the data. And one of the things our boosting algorithm is missing is a stopping rule, but we're working on a GCV out, a GCV statistic that we think will do the trick. At the very, a GCV statistic or more generally um, a dimensionality measure for this. And we're playing with different ideas. Novi and I are back and forth on this. But once we get an idea of the dimensionality of the model, it becomes easier to construct a GCV or AIC or BIC statistic or something like that. One of the things we can get at that I think might be new is we can start to talk about the directionality of the effect, um, possibly. And this is something we're working on. But it's very easy because we're selecting two variables as we can find interactions if they seem to be there in the data. We don't have to permute the x tildes one at a time. We can actually permute both of them for the pairs that come in. And then once we have this in place for mean squared error, um, it's, it should be reasonably straightforward to code it up for deviances, hinge loss, um, the causal loss function for causal forests, those sorts of things. But we, we're trying to get mean squared error correct first. So in conclusion, um, I think that might have come out to about 20 minutes. Oh my god. So um, thank you all for your time. That's okay. <laughs> oh my god. You should see what sorry, happens when I have a paper. Um, anyways. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. And any feedback would be wildly appreciated. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. Uh